I want to just um, talk to you today. It, it, this is just a message uh, really on culture as it relates to this kingdom that we're now a part of. I, I think I'm learning more and more that culture is, is everything. Um, you know, values drive mission, but culture is what establishes everything that we do. And, you know, Jesus, the majority of what he did when he was on the earth was that he came and he taught the, the disciples that were following him really everything about the culture of the kingdom. Because when we talk about, like, heaven um, coming and manifesting in Wilkesboro or wherever it is, we're talking about the culture of our Father coming and being established in the places that we live. And it starts with us, right? You know, I, I, the, the mission that I'm on in life right now is, is the mission of the gospel, which is potent to totally transform our lives. If you believe that, say amen. Can I get a better amen? Um, you know, it, it really is like what Jesus came and gave his life for really is potent to change us. And, and to, to give us capacity by the grace of God to look like the Son of God. And, and so it's, it's really transformation that God is up to on the earth right now because it, it's, it's going to be, how many of you know, it's going to be transformed people that transform culture. You know, we're of another otherworldly kind of culture, and the way that we're going to change the culture around us is just by and allow the transformation that God came and paid for that actually resides in us right now here in this room to just seep on out, right? You remember Jesus in the storm? The disciples were terrified. They were afraid. They thought they were going to die and lose their life. And he just speaks to the winds and to the waves. He says, peace be still. They were in awe because the inward culture of Jesus had an outward effect on the world around him. Can you see that? So we're going to just talk about culture today. And I, I think we're all trying to find our way, right? We're all trying to find our way. I call it to true north, to this transformation reality. Um, but if you want to start somewhere, how many of you know you just got to start somewhere? And, and I believe that that's somewhere that that's actually... It's a deficiency right now, actually, in what I'm, what I'm seeing going on in the body of Christ. I think God wants to bring a reawakening. And starting somewhere is just serving, being a servant, being a heart of a servant. If you'd like, man, I, God, Darren, I don't know where to begin. I would say just be a servant. And what I mean by that is connect your heart. You know, servanthood is all about heart connection. Heart connection is tied to our time primarily, right? Our talents secondly, and our, our, our resources at our disposal. But connect your heart. But from there, to find a way, and Chuck would, would know this because he taught me this as my flight instructor, Chuck Ellsworth, but, but there's, there's what's called triangulation in aviation. And wherever you're at, which should be a servant heart, the way that you find your way to true north is you triangulate off of two different points. And there's... there's navigation equipment inside of airplanes, but the two navigation points that I want to just say to you today, and then we're going to focus on one of them, as servants in the earth right now, we're laying down our lives for friends. Come on. There's friends in this city that don't know Jesus. There's friends in Wilkesboro of God that don't even know that they're called to be a friend of his. So we're called to lay our lives down for friends, and there's no greater love than that. There's no greater love than that. But to get there, we need two things. We need two triangulation points. Worship, and I would say, I call the other one engagement or community, spiritual family, all right? Spiritual family is something that we really need to give ourselves to. So I'm not going to be able to talk about that today, but I want to encourage you, go after relationships. If you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, the African proverb says, go together. There's no other time in human history like now that we need other people. So do whatever you can out of that heart of servanthood to get connected to other people because who you surround yourself with is who you ultimately become. You can tweet that, all right? It's true. You know, the people that we surround ourselves with and we connect ourselves to is who we ultimately become. I've become a better person because of knowing Dan Keisler. That's the truth. Like, he has impacted me as much as hopefully I've impacted him, maybe more, okay? And this is really, really important. But the other thing is worship, to be a worshiper. Now, oftentimes in the church, we limit worship 
to what we do on a Sunday morning as we sit in an audience as a band and a worship team plays on a stage, but it's much deeper than that. It's actually a reflection of the gospel. If you think about worship, the first time worship really moved something in the lives of the children of God, we see it in the Old Testament. Remember when they were released out of Egypt, they're in the wilderness, they cross over the Jordan, in in essence are baptized in the Jordan and enter into the promised land. Can you see the imagery there? Jesus in the wilderness, baptized in the Jordan, enters into the promised land of the new covenant and begins preaching the culture of the kingdom or the gospel of the kingdom. So we see the same reflection. Now what's interesting about the children of God, the nation of Israel, is once they crossed over the Jordan into, this is imagery really, is it happened but it's imagery for us of, of what Jesus did. When they cross over into the new uh, territory that's theirs, that's possessed by um, enemies, if you will, giants, right? You see, the enemy's not going to give up lightly. He's going to position giants in the land. But the first thing that they do is they go to the most fortified city in the entire land called Jericho. And what happens? You guys remember the story? They walk around it seven times, worshiping. At the end, they release a shout, and the walls come down, and fear comes over the enemy and they're able to take total possession of the land. You see, this is what God wants to do in our hearts today. So for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about worship. You have a heart of a servant. You're going to start connecting with other people, but I want you to understand worship. And so we're going to look at seven Hebrew words for worship. Because you see, the Word of God is not like our, our language per se. There's There's many uh, different definitions of a singular word that we would see in English. For example, love. There's a bunch of different expressions of love in the Greek. You know, sorge, agape, phileo, you know, uh, so on and so forth. And so if I say that I love the chicken bites at Brushy Mountain Smokehouse, come on, come on. And then I say, I love my wife. Hopefully, those are two different forms of love. Are you following me? Hopefully. Now, Dan mentioned keto. I'm on this keto diet. If you want to go to the valley of darkness, (laughs) seriously, try giving up chips, bread, and candy. That's tough for me. Dan is such a great friend that he ate a mixing bowl size of banana pudding in front of me yesterday. This is an evil person right here. This is, this is, I'm like four weeks in. I mean, I'm looking out. I'm seeing like Sour Patch Kids on you. I, you know. You're a bag of Cheetos. It's only because I love each of you, you know, that I'm seeing these things. But the point is, is that there's language that's important to culture. And as we talk about worship this morning, I just want to go over these words with you because I think they're going to be keys for us stepping into the ministry culture of God, all right? So seven Hebrew words, quickly. You ready? The first one, and there's tons of scriptures. I'm going to reference maybe a few of them. The first one is the Hebrew word yada, which means to revere or to worship with extended hands or lifted hands. I remember when I first came to Christ at the University of South Carolina, go Gamecocks. I think we play the North Carolina Tar Heels first game of the year, which we will wipe out. Can I get an amen? I'm just kidding. I'm in dangerous territory here saying this kind of stuff. But I had an encounter with the Lord, but I remember the first church that I went to that was lifting hands. And I found that that was strange for me. That was different because I didn't understand culture. 
I didn't understand worship. I didn't understand what it was all about. And Yadah, literally, as, it, as, it's, as it's talking about revere, um, to, to worship with extended hands, it's all about one thing. And if you look it up and you study the context, I don't have time to go into it today, it's all about one thing, trust. So when we're talking about worship and we're talking about Yadahing God, it's about coming into a place of trusting God with our lives. How many of you know that for relationships, trust is everything? If you don't have trust, you don't have a relationship. In fact, that's one of the reasons the enemy loves to erode trust, to break down trust, to dismantle trust between us. That's why we have to fight to have relationship, right? We have to fight for trust. Some of you know, if you, sometimes we have thoughts that, that invade our minds about different people within the body, thinking, oh, maybe they da-da-da or said this or thought this. And when we go to them, most oftentimes we find out none of that stuff was even true. So it's important to go and connect with people, and it's important for us to go and connect with God, to yada God in worship. We are to trust the Lord. You see, yada is, is like a picture of a child that, that runs up to his father or his mother with lifted hands saying, Daddy, pick me up. Take me into your arms. God is raising up. In fact, it says in the word that the eyes of the Lord are roaming to and fro across the entire planet. And what is he looking for? One thing. Those hearts that are truly his. In other words, those hearts that trust him with everything on the inside. This is Yada. This is what he's talking about. Yada is often, and I'm talking to you really from my heart today because this, I just put this message together. This stuff that I'm teaching you today is what has gotten me through the last five years. Trust is this cry for daddy to come and help. In fact, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus was preaching, he said, man, you'll gain entrance into the kingdom of the Father when you have poverty of spirit, he called it. Poverty of spirit is simply a place where in our hearts we're like, God, without you, I can do nothing. There's nothing that I'm going to be able to do without you. That is an amazing place to come to. See, trust is the beginning. Yadah is the beginning of worship. God, we need you in the earth right now. That is going to be the cry where there's something that comes out of the heart of a people that is like, Father, without you, we have absolutely nothing. Are you tracking with me? It's also surrender. When you lift up your hands like this to God, it's like, God, I am surrendering everything to you. It's probably one of the most explosive and meaningful expressions of worship because it's a posture of humility. Right? God, I humble myself before you today, yada. Second one is this, halal. It means, it means to boast, to rave, to shine, to celebrate, and it means to be clamorously foolish. Halal is where we get the word hallelujah. Did you know that hallelujah is one of the only words in the earth that never has to be translated? Hallelujah in Arabic is hallelujah. Hallelujah in French is hallelujah. Hallelujah in whatever language, pick a language, is hallelujah. It's not translated. It's only transliterated. Hallelujah is this word that I believe God wants to restore in the earth right now again because it literally means to rave. It means to boast. It means to do it to such a degree that you actually appear foolish. Oh boy, here we go. Come on, brother. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, to rave, it has to do with triumph. Hallelujah means rave, and, and Yah means God. In fact, you know what's awesome? When we moved to South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, I discovered that Fort Lauderdale literally means fortress of praise. Fort Laud. Fortress of praise. And God was like, I'm going to make my cities in the earth fortresses of hallelujahs again. 
fortresses of praise, fortresses of triumph. You see, hallelujahs are um, one of the most spontaneous outcries of one who is excited about God. Now, here's the thing, though, okay? What's interesting about hallelujah or halal is it's only used 24 times in the entire Old Testament and only four times in the New Testament. So I was thinking about this. I was like, church, you can look foolish, but don't look foolish all the time. (laughs) Come on, right? You ever met the hallelujah brother type of people? You know what I mean? They're weird, right? I'm not talking about being weird. I'm saying there may be an excitement that comes over your heart, a triumph that comes over your heart that you need to shout out to God, hallelujah. And those are moments in your life that will mark you forever. Can I get an amen right there? All right, number three, Zamar. This is the one that we consider worship today. It's it's to make music with instruments accompanied by voices. So I'm not going to go much into that, but there is legitimacy to us coming together and singing songs. How many of you know moments like this, not only do they shift the atmosphere in the room, but they're actually moving stuff in the atmosphere of this city? I mean, if you ever come into church on a Sunday and you're like, man, I feel a little down, I feel a little discouraged, and man, worship starts going, and everything starts moving, and you're like, man, I feel better already. That's why it talks about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves with other believers, because there's something about making music with instruments accompanied by voices. Listen, I don't understand this fully, but there's power on guitars. There's power on drums. There's power on bass guitars and and keyboards and vocals. That's why I tell our worship team, listen, when you're up there, go for it with all of your heart. Just go for it. Zamar, man. Just do it. Like, release it. Because there's, there's something about your action on an instrument, which I'm unable to play. My dream is, like, when I get to heaven, that I'll be able to just pick up an electric guitar and just play some 80s power chords. Come on, somebody. In fact, I begged my electric guitarist to just duct tape my hand to a power chord on the electric and let me just play one Sunday, please. But there's something powerful about it, right? There's something very powerful about music. And we need to recapture that power in the body of Christ. Come on, somebody. All right, Todah, number four. This one, this one is really powerful because it means thanksgiving for things yet to be fulfilled. Whoo. In fact, I want to ask you a question because at the end, we're going to do a little uh, activity together. I want to ask you a question. What in your life is it that you know is a promise from God that he's spoken to you, that you're confirmed in your heart, that has yet to be fulfilled? I want you to write that thing down. I want you to paste it up somewhere where every day you get up, and I want you to begin to toe God and thank God for that which he has promised that is not yet but is coming. Come on, somebody. We had this, this couple in our church. Uh, they were faithful. They, they, they helped us to, to plant the, the, the work in South Florida. They, you know, gave themselves to it with all of their heart. And... They couldn't have children in the natural. In fact, the doctors told them it was impossible. And so they began going the foster care and adoption route, and they had 44 children come through their home. Isn't that amazing? And they ended up adopting five kids out of those 44 that came through their home. But you know what? Then they started to toda God and give him thanks because she got a promise, the wife got a promise that they were going to have children. And she began to thank God in advance. And wouldn't you know it, that year, boom, she gets pregnant after 13 years of marriage. This is real. And then to make matters even better, the next year they follow up with another baby. So they had a boy, a girl, and then a boy. Isn't that incredible? See, this is how good God is. This is what worship is about. I I just feel to say this. There's some promises sitting in this room 
that some of you need to toda for. You know, a lot of times the enemy wants us just to resign. You know, we've had stuff spoken. We know that we're supposed to step into some things, right? And then the enemy comes and just tells us, well, that's never going to happen. You're just maybe making this up. You know what? At the end of the day, I think we need to get back to worship and start taking back some of the things that have been delayed in our lives. Come on, somebody. I like this because toda is not something actually that we even do alone. It's actually, if you look at the language of it, it's like it, it, it's indicative of like a choir of worshipers versus just a couple. It's 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 in, indicative of togetherness, um, where we we stand with one another to say, "Hey, listen, you're not alone in this journey. Like, I'm gonna actually stand with you for your promise." That's where like some community starts blending into worship here. Because we start saying, hey, listen, the promise over you is also my promise because when you get your promise, that benefits all of us. Oh. Come on. Oh, my gosh, I just felt something on that. Like we sometimes live so much for ourselves and we think, man, if I just get into my ministry or my thing or my dream or God moves in my business or in my family. No, listen, we need to stand for the collective whole because God wants the whole church to be moving as worshipers, not just a few singled out ones. Come on, somebody, right? So the tada is where, man, I think there's going to be a breakout. I feel like God's going to break out in this realm because we're going to start standing for everybody's dreams. In fact, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, he actually matured to such a level that he wasn't even about his dreams. He was about the dreams of the ones that were around him. And he became famous for making other people's dreams come true. That's the one thing I'm, I'm detouring a little bit, but I, that's one thing I don't like about the pop culture Christianity thing today. It's all about the superstar. And I, and I, I appreciate giftedness. I appreciate people that are well-known ministers and worship leaders and all of that. But more than that, I want to say, how many dreams have you seen come true because of your life and your influence in other people? That's where the money meets the road in far, as far as I'm concerned, all right? A couple more, and then we're going to go back into just a little bit of worship. This one I love, Barak. It means to kneel or to bow before God. To bless, to praise, to salute, to thank. It's actually this transcendent blessing transcendent privilege of, of blessing the Lord. Here's what it really is. Listen to me. It's a lifestyle of yielding yourself to God. To yielding. You see, in the world, it teaches you to stand, to take charge, to mow over whoever it takes to get to where you're going. In the kingdom, it takes people getting down on their knees and saying, God, I yield once again. I bow. If you, look, if you look at the disciples, right, John, who knew Jesus the most, when he saw him, remember when he was taken up and he saw him in his glorified state? John, who leaned his head on the earth, on the breast of Jesus, when he sees him in this glorified state, what does he do? He falls on his face like a dead man. When we really get a hold of the glory of this one Jesus, trust me, we will yield with all fullness before him. I've heard of this. I've never experienced this a bunch, but I've heard of like the awe and wonder of God coming into a room and people just fall on their faces. It's the only response. Really? Like, do we, I, I am all, we are all about at the harbor, friendship with God, intimacy, deep connection. I, I'm all about, he's my f best friend. But also, man, there's a place where, man, when I see him for who he really is, I just, <laughs> even with, I mean, you ever notice even in the word, like with the disciples, they have these crowns are sitting on thrones, and then when Jesus comes into their midst, they bow their knee and they cast their crowns at his feet. <sighs> Come on.
come on. When we understand what God has done in our lives, it's not about our position, our authority, our reward. It's about him. Almost done. Tequila. I didn't say tequila. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. If I had a little more southern drawl, I might have said tequila. But this one's awesome. It's, it's a spontaneous song. You ever been in a worship moment where there's a spontaneous song that comes forth? And you, it's really happening. There's nothing like it. To sing a new song, to sing a laudation, to sing a praise. You see, Tehillah involves music, but it mostly involves singing. Sometimes I've been in settings where the music fades and the words just come, right? And it's actually you get connected with the others that are in that moment, and it's almost like you're singing the same song. It's amazing. There are 300 Bible mandates to sing and to lift up our voices and to sing a spontaneous, come on, you ever been in your car and you're listening to worship and God comes and then you're just like, ah, you know, like because no one's listening, right? And then you look over and there's that person next to you at the light and they're like, and you're like, oh my gosh, but then you just go right back in. Come on, that's what I'm talking about. But the word here suggests that actually it's where God himself becomes our song. It's like he's so living and active on the inside. Every time we release something, it's actually him coming out of our mouth. Last one, and can I have the worship team come back up if that's okay? It's Shabbat. And this one is simply a joyful shout or address in a loud tone. It means to commend, to give glory, to triumph again. It's like that verse that says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Shout unto God with a voice of praise. It's like you release a roar. I believe I gave you seven words. I want you to think about this. I believe when they walked around Jericho, how many times? I believe they did each of these. Each time they went around. And at the end, when they shabbat, those walls were already trembling. Because there's no walls that can keep Jesus out. But there's a process, right? There's a process. And, and, and this is where I think God is, is taking us as the body of Christ. He's growing us so that when we release the shout, so to speak. In fact, if you look at the language when Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, and it says, pray like this, Kingdom come, will of God be done. It's actually not a question. It's a command. It's a shout. It's a shabak. So as we wrap this up, could we just maybe on the keyboard, I just want to flow in something. Um, and then we'll just kind of go there for just a little bit. I, I want to... I want to ask you to do something just quickly as we, as we wrap this up. Could you stand with me just all over this place? Father, you found us here today. You found us here in this place, Lord. I don't believe anybody's here by accident or by coincidence. Would you help to, to move us away from familiarity with words and religious language? And would you come and would you culturalize us in your heart? 
And would you do that today by raising up a generation, young and old, of worshipers in the earth? Because God, we don't want to wander in the wilderness. And for sure, we don't want to step over into a promise and not obtain the promise. We want to take ground. We want to move forward. We want to see the reward of Jesus' suffering come to pass. And so when you get our lives and worship becomes our portion, it gives others permission to follow in that which we've come to obtain in our own hearts. So could we just... You daw the Lord as we start. Could we just say, Daddy, we trust you. We surrender to you. We posture ourselves in humility. And we do all this by lifting our hands in surrender, in honor, and in trust. And we reach for you. Come on, if you need something in your life right now, if you have a cry for help, I want you just to lift up your hands and I want you to say to God, you don't have to say it out loud, but I want you to say it in your heart. I want you to say, God, without you, this thing that I need is gonna be impossible and I actually look to you right now and I trust you to come and meet me in this place as I surrender, as I lift my hands in humility as I give my heart to you today in this new way.